do those things. Now, if I were to ask everybody in this room tonight how important Medicare is to you, I think I get a pretty solid answer that it's one of the foundational things of our country, right? So Stephen Harper once ran the National Citizens Coalition. The National Citizens Coalition was run and created by a private um, drug uh, salesman from London, Ontario, who was dedicated to the destruction of Medicare. He wanted all of it to be private. And that's why he set up the NCC, which Stephen Harper became president of in 1997. And um, since becoming a prime minister, Stephen Harper has let the health accord lapse. There is no health accord now between Ottawa and the provinces. It's lapsed. The agreement that was struck in Victoria was a deal in which Jim Flaherty, the late Jim Flaherty, took out his checkbook, told everybody to put their documents away, all the health ministers were not negotiating anything. Here's the money you asked for. Spend it on snowblowers if you want to. Here it is. No national standards attached to it, no conditions, just the check. They then cut $38 billion and say, we're not really cutting it, we're just slowing the growth of the inmates. Love euphemisms, people in Ottawa. $38 billion will be subtracted from Medicare by 2017. And the interesting thing about the number is that little places, like the place I come from and other small places in Canada, will quickly have third world health care. Provinces that have a, a wealthy tax base and large numbers of people might still have a first class health care system, but I think that it will be a very different system from the public system we have now. It'll depend upon the wealth of that person. It'll be checkbook medicine rather than medicine that comes from a sense that everybody in the country ought to be equal in a couple of places before the courts and before your doctor. I think we should all expect that. But in this case, Stephen Harper has left us in the position where he's done away with national standards quite cleverly by giving the money to the provinces. But here's the next step, and this is the part that I think will happen to us if he's elected again. I think Stephen Harper will transfer the tax credits for Medicare to the provinces using the argument they administer health care, so it's democratic. They should have the tax credits. And then Ottawa will finally and forever have the gun of Medicare off its shoe. They won't be responsible anymore. And it will come down to a place like PEI being instantly third world, and the bigger provinces like Ontario, Quebec, having to cut back, but still able to give uh, first or second class care. And maybe if there's a wealthy province in the resource, in the resource part of the country, if oil ever returns from forty dollars a barrel, which I doubt, um, those will be the people who will benefit. But the national health care system will be will be uh, destroyed. Another human face that I looked at in the research for the book was the face of Canadian veterans. Yeah. Nobody's image has been milked for more political gain by Harper than the military and the veterans. There's not a single group in the country. And uh, the promise initially was the best of care for our military personnel who served and for those who were wounded who came back either physically wounded or with PTSD and mental injuries from the theater would be taken care of. And here's the reality of what happened. Once Harper made the decision he was going to balance the budget, he took 30% of the operating budget of the Veterans Affairs Department and cut it in one fell swoop. $226 million gone in a heartbeat. One of the ways that he achieved the cut was he closed nine of the Veterans Affairs Centers which administered their health care, which administered uh, their physical rehab, and they did it in an environment dedicated to veterans. Not in a general government center where everybody who was collecting maternity benefits or EI benefits would line up with our veterans who were looking for very different sorts of help. Now the funny thing is this. The Veterans Affairs Office that they cut saved them three and a half million dollars. There was nine of them. And when those nine centers were closed, the government was savagely criticized. You remember the veterans went to Ottawa and tried to get a meeting with the great Julian Fantino, who arrived 70 minutes late and then left in a huff because so many criticized him. The fact of the matter is, the government then gave Julian Fantino $4.5 million for his advertising budget 
Dubai ads about how well they were treating veterans to put around the hockey games. Yeah. If they had not spent that money, if they had used that money, they could have kept every vac center open plus had a million dollars left in the kit. But that's not, that's not how they operate. And one of the great injustices that we have to deal with in this election is that the new Veterans Charter has reduced people with lifelong disabilities to people who are going to get a one-time uh, payment for a lifelong disability. So the new rule says this. If you have had severe injury from, for example, 40,000 Canadians served in Afghanistan, if you're one of those that came back seriously wounded, you are eligible to get a $300,000 once-only payment. And uh, Julian Fantino said that's more than generous. Uh, but what he forgot to tell everybody was only 121 people have ever received the maximum award. The average award is $41,000. Now under the old veterans arrangements, if you came back with a permanent disability, an amputation, or something like that, you got a $31,000 tax-free um, pension for life. The liability and disability is for life, so too should be the benefit. I don't think we can treat veterans worse than they treat people at the workers' compensation board. The accident happens in a factory. And so one of the things that has to happen is Stephen Harper has to get the message that this double speak that he uses all the time has got to come to an end. On the day that he received the flag from Afghanistan, the last Canadian flag that flew there, he had instructed federal lawyers to argue against veterans groups in BC that there was any kind of, quote, sacred obligation in law for him to take care of these people. So at the same time he's getting the photo op, he's taking them to court. And if you see the pattern with Harper, it's always the same. Native Canadians are people I spent a lot of time with. I've been on most of the reserves in the country. I've talked to most of the chiefs in the 630 bands. And their situation is somewhat similar to what's happening with the veterans. Remember the great reset button Stephen Harper was going to set with Native people. He was going to say he's sorry for the residential school. There was a big public apology, a ceremony. This guy loves ceremonies. He's not very good on follow through, though. So the natives, 630 bands received the same 30% cut that the veterans received. And in some cases, where the government deemed that the bands in Saskatchewan were too political, i.e., they disagreed with government policy and wanted to protect what they saw as their resources and their land, their cuts were 80% by Stephen Martin. And now, even the residential school issue, if you look at it, he sets up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and then they got to take him to court to get the documents to do their work. And it's like that over and over again. And if you're not paying attention, you know, if you're not paying attention, Stephen Harper will behave you under. And that's one of the biggest, one of the biggest issues on the table. But the one that is sort of the mother of all the issues that hasn't gotten a lot of attention is what this guy has done to Canadian democracy. Yeah. Canadian yeah. democracy has been so seriously wounded by this man, it's hard to imagine anything worse. And this is not the opinion of your speaker tonight. I spent a lot of time with three people who know the parliamentary system better than anybody I know. One of them, is Peter Milliken. He was the longest serving House of Commons speaker in history. He is the dean of speakers in uh, Western democracies. They look to him for answers on procedural matters. Robert Marlowe was clerk of the House of Commons for 10 years. He was also hired by Stephen Harper as his information commissioner. He knows a thing or two about the system. And finally, somebody it was kind of funny, I had Sheila Fraser over to my apartment and uh, we were having a very serious talk and she lowered her glasses and didn't want to see the Auditor General squint. <laughs> and she did this and gave me her squint, the one that she scares me of. <laughs> but she, uh, she, she said that democracy um, doesn't exist anymore unless somebody restores us to what we once had. And what in particular does that mean? I'm a stickler for detail. Because that's where the truth usually resides in a new office. Here's what she meant. Under the parliamentary system, what do our MPs do? We elect a parliament, not a government, and all the MPs are supposed to scrutinize this, the party that has the most seats when they spend our money. What we've gotten under Stephen Harper is public expenditure without verification. He puts out budgets 
without planning and priorities reports. There is no mention of where the money is going to be spent. So the empties are lost in space. They don't know where to begin. And the same with cuts. He doesn't announce where the cuts are going to be made, so no one can criticize them. And a classic example of this is Kevin Page said, I can't do my job as the parliamentary budget officer uh, advising parliamentarians unless I get this financial information. And he went to the clerk of the Privy Council, which in my opinion has been politicized like the RCMP and every other agency of government under this dictatorial personality that runs the country. And he was told by the chief clerk, the top civil servant in Canada, that the parliamentary budget officer acting under a statute could not have the information. And you know what he said to Wayne Waters, who was the clerk for a he said, for God's sakes, Wayne, don't put that in a letter. You just told me that, but if you put it in a letter, that's the top civil servant in the country saying that the parliamentary budget officer can't have the information to do his job and it will be very bad for the whole system. We've had more closure votes, more debates that were forced closed by this government time allocation in our, than any other time in our history. We've got committees, committee systems, that can't pick their witnesses of choice. They no longer have funds to travel the country and have public hearings. Anything either bit controversial goes behind uh, closed doors. And um, the last thing about the parliamentary system that we've got to remember is Stephen Harper was elected because the Liberals they were very successful with the economy, seven or eight balanced budgets in a row, became morally bankrupt during the ad sponsorship scandal where public monies were cycled through crown corporations and ended up part of it back in the hands of the Liberal Party. We know about that. That's why it makes me laugh when people say, all people care about is the economy. If that were true, Paul Martin would have won the 2006 election. I beg to differ. I think people expect you to be trustworthy if you're going to leave the country. And uh, I think they came to the conclusion that even though Paul Martin wasn't personally involved in ad sponsorship, his part was. And they had to be, they had to, they had to keep, they needed some quiet time to get their act together. Stephen Harper was the recipient of the power based on the promise of two things, you'll recall. Accountability and transparency. <laughs> Can you imagine a further distance in the universe between those two words and what Stephen Harper has delivered? The whole two years have been fraud. It's been a fraud, a Wizard of Oz kind of uh, marketed fake image. He's got almost as many spinners as the House of Commons has staff now. Over 2,000 people dedicated to constantly spinning the correct scenario for Stephen Parker. I'm going to um, end this part of the night with a little word about unions. Stephen Harper brought in uh, Bill 377. It is a thin, thinly disguised copy of what Wisconsin and other U.S. states have done with respect to so-called right-to-work legislation. Really, it's death to unions legislation. And what is interesting about it is, unions have a legal right in this country to exist. The same way as non-governmental agencies have a legal right to express an opinion. And now all of that has changed under Stephen Harper. So Mr. Heber brings in 377 now they say, we're going to make you accountable. I find it a little strange that Stephen Harper wants us to applaud 377 over accountability when he won't even tell Canadians how he's spending the money in the budget. We get on to this legislation in which everything but the kitchen sink is thrown in and no accountability on the numbers. He wants everybody to be accountable but himself. And that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I think this election, I describe it as a Rubicon election. If we don't stand up now, and this is not a political statement, this is a Canadian statement. If we don't stand up to him now, some of the principles which I always believed were inviolate in this country, some of the topics we've talked about, including Medicare, would fit that category for me. Those things will be lost forever. And um, I'll leave you with one of my, one of my favorite quotes. It is, uh, those make the greatest mistake who think that because they can do little, they can do nothing. We can do a great deal, but we have to be engaged. Thank you.